shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. Here's today's prophecy update. There are four accounts of the second coming of Jesus to the earth in the book of Revelation. Because of this, many have become very confused concerning the order of the Bible's most famous prophecy book. Today, we will examine all four accounts of the second coming and will explain the chronological order of Revelation. This is especially important since the second coming will happen very soon now. We're going to be looking at the order of the book of Revelation. Now, before we actually begin, I want to call your attention to three different things that are repeated in the book of Revelation almost exactly because they, in fact, are the same event. The first one is what is known as the Six, the seventh seal. Let me read it to you. This is Revelation 8, verse 5. There are seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials in the book of Revelation. So I want you to listen to the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh vial, and see if you don't agree that this is the exact same event. The seventh seal is recorded in Revelation 8, 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now remember that. Let's now take a look at the seventh trumpet. And the temple of God was opened. This is by the way, Revelation 11, verse 19. The temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Remember, that's the seventh trumpet. Now let's go to the seventh vial. This is Revelation 16, verse number 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. Later on, it also talks about a great hail. So we see these three different times. We've got the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, and at the end of each of these series of seven is the refrain, and there were voices, thunderings, earthquakes, and great hail. So what does that mean to us then? That simply means that the seals are one account leading to the second coming. The seals happen to be the long account, expanding over many years. Then the trumpets are another account leading to the second coming over not as many years. Then the vials are the real short account leading to the second coming perhaps over just a matter of months. We don't know for sure about that, but they all end up at the same place. They all end up at the battle of Armageddon. Now with that understood, let's look at the order of the book of Revelation. I want you to hear the account of the sixth and seventh seal. It begins in Revelation chapter number six, verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell under the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now watch this, verse 14. 
and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, the lamb being Jesus, of course, for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand. Now that's under the sixth seal, but it quickly goes into the seventh seal after interjecting the seventh chapter of Revelation. The seventh seal is in Revelation eight, verse one. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And then in verse five, it concludes the seventh seal. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. All right, now that's the account of the seven seals. There are many things in that account that lead up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. But the second coming happens when the heavens depart like a scroll and then finally, there are voices, thunderings, and earthquakes, and great hail. Now let's look at the seventh trumpet. The seven trumpets begin in Revelation chapter 8 and continue on to the end of chapter number 11. When we get to the seventh trumpet, it's recorded in verse number 15 of Revelation chapter 11. Here's what it says. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now let's pause just a moment there. Because when you talk about the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, the Bible teaches repeatedly that that's what happens at the second coming. Right now, the kingdoms of this world are ruled over by Satan. Satan said, the kingdoms of the world are mine. I give them to whomsoever I will. Well, that's true temporarily. Even Jesus acknowledged it during his trial in Pilate's judgment hall. Jesus said to Pilate, Pilate said, are you a king? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this age. But hereafter shall you see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus spoke of a time to come when he would come to the earth. And that's what I just read to you. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Again, it's an account of the second coming. Verse 16 tells us more about it. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. Remember, the wrath came back under the sixth seal. The rich men, the kings of the earth, the mighty men said to the rocks and mountains, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne for the, gray of his, the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Well, here we are again. That was the seventh, sixth and seventh seal. Now here we are in the seventh trumpet, same thing. And thy wrath has come and the time that the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So it's the time of judgment and it's the time of reward to those people who submitted themselves during this life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It will be reward to those people who rebelled against the Lordship of Jesus Christ and did their 
own thing, the song says, I did it my way, they're going to receive the wrath of Almighty God. And then finally in verse number 19, it tells us, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple, the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So seventh seal says it, seventh trumpet says it. Now let's look at the seventh vial. It's Revelation 16, verse 17 and 18. Now in verse 16 of chapter 16, it states there, and he gathered them into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Then verse 17 says, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Wow, how climactic is that? I mean, we've been through the seals, the trumpets, and now we're the last vial and this voice says, it is done. Now verse number 18, and remember, this is part of the seventh vial. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. So again, at the seventh vial, we see that there were thunderings, voices, lightnings, earthquake, great hail. So it's the same thing each time. So what's going on here as far as the book of Revelation goes? Well, I want to finish with the seventh, with the seventh vial because this is so important. The seventh vial actually it takes uh, several chapters from the 16th chapter all the way to the end of the 19th chapter to record many of the things that will happen at the seventh vial. And chapter 17 and 18 are devoted to the judgment of false Christianity in the world. The Bible depicts false Christianity as a harlot. True Christianity is depicted as a virgin in the Bible. False Christianity is depicted as a harlot. So Revelation 17 and Revelation 18 are devoted to the judgment against the great harlot, against false Christianity. Most of Christianity, according to the Bible, according to the prophecies, both Catholic and Protestant will follow the false prophet into an alliance with the Antichrist. That's what Revelation 17 and 18 is really all about. Then we get to chapter number 19 and we come there to the time when the bride hath made herself ready, the Bible says. Um, the person speaking with John said to him, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. We're in chapter 19 now, and the marriage has not happened yet. The marriage of the Lamb is come, and His bride, which is the church, everybody that studies their Bible knows that. The bride is the church. The bride hath made herself ready. Then we go to verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. Here we go, heaven's open again. Heaven depart like, departs like a scroll. It's the same thing. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So we see this account of the second coming. Now I want to pause there for just a moment because we have produced a DVD. It's called When Will the Rapture Happen? So many people study the book of Revelation and after a while they're so confused because they think Revelation is in chronological order from beginning to end and it's not. So they end up just absolutely bewildered by the book of Revelation. And then they start wondering, well, is, is there a pre-trib rapture? Is there a mid-trib rapture? Is there a post-trib rapture? There's one person that was teaching seven subsequent raptures all kinds of things because they do not understand the chronology of the book of Revelation. I had so many people ask me, I suppose in my conferences, I've been asked at least a thousand times, okay, when does the rapture happen? I finally decided, look, this is the most prominent question I get. I'm just going to go ahead and answer it biblically and forthrightly. So I did a one hour DVD 
is entitled, When Will the Rapture Happen? And I take you from verse to verse to verse. By the time you're done, you'll have zero doubt. You will know when the rapture happens. Is it pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? There won't be any doubt left. We answer it biblically. If you'd like to have your own copy of When Will the Rapture Happen? Pick up the phone and call us right now. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. Or if you prefer to order online, simply go to endtime.com, E-N-D-T-I-M-E dot com. And there's a place there for you can order. You can visit our store. And the title is, When Will the Rapture Happen? So if you have any doubts, this will give you the scriptural proof where on God's timeline, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, exactly when will the rapture happen? We give you the scriptures step by step. I don't want to leave any question in your mind. I don't want to leave it to the opinion of men, but I want you to know what the Bible actually does say. All right, let's get back to our study. The last thing we're going to look at, the last account of the second coming of Jesus is not quite the same as the other three. We've got seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. But in this account, it's in chapter number 14 of the book of Revelation. We call this the two simultaneous harvest. Remember in Matthew chapter 13 where Jesus told a parable about a certain man that sowed good seed in his field. But while he and his servants slept, an enemy that hated the owner came and sowed tares among the wheat, trying to destroy his harvest. Well, they all asked the master, when the tares started coming up, shall we go out and shall we pull up the tares? And he said, oh no, don't do that because you'll pull up the wheat with it. Let them grow together till the time of harvest. And at that time, we will gather them both, cast the tares into the fire and gather the wheat into the barn. Now that's the account that Jesus gave of the two simultaneous harvests. But the same account is given in a different way in Revelation chapter 14. There are two harvests there. Let's begin with chapter 14, verse number 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now keep that in your mind, the term, the harvest of the earth. The harvest of the earth is ripe. Now verse 16. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. Now that's the rapture of the church. That's the second coming. Verse 17 then describes the battle of Armageddon. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. Notice it doesn't say the harvest of the earth. Gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. I wonder where the winepress of the wrath of God. Now remember, it's at the second coming that the time of his wrath happens. Same thing here. Now you're going to cast what you're going to reap from the earth, the vine of the earth, you're going to cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city 
and blood came out of the wine press. Now, where does it happen? Without the city, right? It's talking about the city of Jerusalem. That's where the battle of Armageddon is going to culminate. That's where it will be its most intense. Just as Jerusalem is on the brink of being toppled by the world government forces of the Antichrist. Outside the city in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, also known as the Valley of Slaughter, also referred to as the Kidron Valley. It's right outside the walls of Jerusalem, just outside the Temple Mount. So the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Ten furlongs equal one mile. That means blood will flow by the distance of 160 miles. If you go to the plain of Megiddo in the north and go over to the Jordan Valley, which is normally the way you would go, down the Jordan Valley into the gates of Jerusalem, that distance is 160 miles. This last harvest of the vine of the earth is talking about the battle of Armageddon. And it says that blood will flow by the space of 1,600 furlongs or 160 miles. All right, let's review now. What have we learned here? You have the seven seals, which are the long story beginning as early as 325 A.D., culminating at Armageddon. You have the trumpets, which began a little over 100 years ago now, culminating at Armageddon. And then you have the vials, the real short story, which don't begin till at least the mark of the beast is passed out halfway through the final seven years. But they too culminate at Armageddon. They all end up with, and there were voices, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Then we have this other account in Revelation chapter number 14 of the two harvests, the two simultaneous harvests, the harvest of the wheat, the harvest of the tares. They're all the same thing. Jesus himself gave another account in his most famous prophecy chapter, Matthew chapter number 24. In verse number 29, it states, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars will fall from heaven, the mountains and islands will be moved out of their places. We've already read that. Those are the things that happen under the sixth and seventh seal. Now Jesus says also they will happen immediately after the tribulation. And then it says, and then shall you see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. He will send his four angels to the four winds of the heavens to gather his elect from one end of heaven to the other. It's another account of the second coming. Every single account we have in Scripture follows the exact same pattern. So let's look then. What is the chronology of the book of Revelation. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 were addressed to the time that John wrote. In chapter 1, verse 19, John was told, Write the things thou hast seen, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter. So the things thou hast seen were recorded in chapter number 1. Then chapters 2 and 3 recorded the things that are. There were seven churches in Asia Minor, and God sent special messages to those seven churches, Ephesus, Thyatira, Sardis, and all those seven churches. History tells us that John, after his exile was over, returned to Asia Minor, which is today's Turkey, and was the overseer of those seven churches. So those are the things that are. And then the other category that John was told to write were the things that sh must be hereafter. When you get to chapter 4, verse 1, John heard a voice as the sound of a trumpet saying, Come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. That's where the prophetic portion of the book of Revelation begins. Then chapters 4 through chapter number 8, verse 5, 
tells the story of the seven seals. And then chapter eight, verse six through chapter 11 tells the story of the seven trumpets, both of those ending with the second coming. And then chapters number 12 through 14 gives us the, another account of the events leading up to the second coming, culminating in chapter 14 with the two simultaneous harvests. Then it starts over again in chapter 15 through chapter number 19. It talks about the seven vials, again ending with the battle of Armageddon. So we're talking today about the order of events in the book of Revelation. There are four dramatic accounts of the second coming. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 through 16, plus chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. Revelation chapter 11, verse number 15 through 19. Revelation chapter number 14, verse 14 through 20. And Revelation chapter number 15 through chapter 19. And the second coming especially is described in, in detail in chapter 19. The marriage of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. The heavens depart like a scroll. And here he comes. Well, let me remind you once again. We have a DVD called when will the rapture happen? If you want to know the theology of it, it's a one hour DVD, call us 1 800 in time. Also, we'd like to invite you today to become a partner with End Time Ministries. The second coming is really close. We've got to reach the whole world with this message in the very short time just ahead. We need you to join your strength with our strength as we declare this message to the whole world, television, radio, every way possible. If you'd like to be a partner, call us. 800 end times the number to call or go to endtime.com. You're listening to End of the Age. Rod, a cut to the chase. Our stated purpose will be to save the world from global warming, polluted water, and contaminated air. However, she continued, our real goal is to form a world government founded on the principles of democratic socialism. Mora smiled at her candor. Rada, he said, this room is one of the few places in the world that you could make that statement without creating an anti-world government revolution. All of us must be very discreet about what we say and to whom we speak. The politically correct phrase that we will use from now on will be global governance. But Morris Rada protested, do you think a slight change in wording can make that much difference? Let's face it, it's only a matter of semantics. I know Rada, but when leading the masses, perception is everything. Patriotism is one of the most deeply held emotions in the heart of mankind. People will proudly send their sons to die in a war that they don't even understand, all for the love of their country. We will need to enlist every journalist and every newscaster sympathetic to our cause to help sell our message, which will have to be clearly defined. To order the novel, Dark Intentions, written by Irvin Baxter, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archives button. We will be taking your calls in this part of the program. The number to call to be on the air with me, 877-END-TIME. That's 877-363-8463. For those of you that perhaps got on in on the tail of the first half hour, you may be interested in how to order our When Will the Rapture Happen DVD. Simply call 800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. The title of the DVD is, When Will the Rapture Happen? Also, if you'd like to become a partner with us, then that's the same number to call, 1-800-END-TIME. Simply ask to speak to someone about uh, the 
uh, the tour and also how to be a partner. I do want to talk to you about the tour because it's getting really close now. You need to act now. Some of you have been sort of thinking about it, debating in your mind. Well, don't debate any longer. Today's the day you break through that wall of procrastination and just pick up the phone and call us. It doesn't cost you anything to call, but you can get the information you need to make the decision that you want to make. So if you're interested at all in going with Judy and I on October the 27th through November the 7th, a total of 12 days, I'll remind you, this is not one of those kiss them quick tours because you can go on those eight day tours and I feel so sorry for people who make that mistake because it's two days travel over, two days travel back, you really tour about four days. Whereas on one of our tours, you get eight to nine full days of travel. And since you've got the expense of getting them back anyway, it only makes sense to spend a little bit more so that you can stay for a marvelous 12-day, once-in-a-lifetime tour. And let me promise you, it is totally safe. There's not a problem with it whatsoever. And so uh, don't worry about that. I mean, you're much safer to be in Israel than you are in Chicago. Uh, even with the terrorist attack that happened toward the Jewish people, uh, no Americans were involved, but the terrorist attack toward the Jewish people over the last six months, I think they had 32 fatalities while they were doing that in Chicago. During that same time period, they had 350 fatalities just in one city. So don't let the news media blow this out of proportion in your mind. The fact is, it is totally safe in Israel. The reason it seems sometimes so dramatically unsafe is because every small incident becomes a world headline. You can have a triple murder in New York and we never even know about it. But if you have somebody throwing rocks on the Temple Mount in Israel, it becomes world headlines. So don't let the news media throw everything out of perspective. I've been there every year since 1993 and I've never been endangered. I've always had a wonderful time there. And I'll be leading you every step of the way. We'll be having breakfast, dinner, and supper with you, and also be on the buses with you every day. We'll have on-site prophecy briefings. Let me tell you, you've never experienced anything until you stand on the Mount of Olives, where the Bible specifically says Jesus is coming back to. You stand there, and I read from the Bible the words of Jesus, and you look around and say, oh my goodness, I am standing on the very spot. And you think about, I'm here now, but I want to make sure I come back with him when he comes at his second coming. It's going to be an incredible time. Uh, so it is just absolutely marvelous. It's absolutely wonderful. Now, we're having just a little bit of technical difficulty. However, I'm going to go ahead and go to the phones anyway. Uh, and I, if I don't call your name exactly right, it's because the screen is so dim. But I think I've got this one calling from. Okay, I guess he is gone. So I don't have this. Well, listen, while they're getting all that worked out, uh, let's go now uh, to another article that I thought you needed to hear. This article comes from the LA Times just uh, yesterday. Supreme Court grants emergency order to block transgender male student in Virginia from using boys' restroom. Now, all of you know that the Obama administration issued this insane order that if a girl says, I'm a boy, she can walk in with all the physical parts of being a girl, but she can go into the boys' restroom and use the boys' shower. Or if a boy says, I'm a girl, that's my gender identity, he can go shower with the girls even though he's still physically, fully male. Now, this present administration issued an order that this had to happen. And if you don't comply, I'm talking about all the school districts, they will withhold your funding. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you hear what I'm saying? This is the same insane 
administration that pushed and pushed and pushed until the Supreme Court ruled that a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman. And now then they're doing it all over the United States of America. I'm talking about this administration is anti-God because that's directly against God, anti-Bible. I wouldn't be surprised if they thought they would get by with it, if they would hold a Bible burning because they hate the Bible. It teaches everything they're doing is incorrect. It's not only incorrect, it's horrible. It's an abomination. So anyway, now then the court has come along and done the first thing right they've done in a long time. The Supreme Court intervened for the first time Wednesday in the controversy over transgender rights and blocked a lower court ruling that would have allowed a transgender boy, only it's really a girl, but she says she's a boy, allow a transgender boy to use the high school restroom that fits with his gender identity. In an unusual five to three order, you know, there's only eight members of the Supreme Court right now, the justices granted an emergency appeal from a Virginia school board, which said it is fighting to protect the basic expectations of bodily privacy of Gloucester County students. The school board was seeking to be exempted from the Obama administration's position that schools nationwide are required to allow transgender students to use the bathroom they prefer no matter what they really are. Justice Stephen G. Breyer signaled he did not support the school board's emergency appeal, but said he joined the court's four conservatives as a courtesy to put the issue on hold until the justices can review the matter when they return in the fall and probably when they have their next member who can break the tie. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but we're going back to Denmark now. And if I can see correctly, I think it's Oli. And if it's not that, please for, forgive me. Uh, but Oli, you're on the air. Okay, thank you, Irvin. Hello, can you hear me? I hear you well, thank you. I have a little, uh, your voice is a little low. But I will, I'll give you my question. And uh, after the question, I have a little comment to okay. the question. All right. It's, a, it's about uh, Daniel eleven twenty three. You know, it says, uh, and after a league made with him, he shall come, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with the small people. So my question is, who is this uh, small people? We know he's a, uh, he's a, the Antichrist is a small, is a small king, is a little horn. Hence, he's a, a small king of a small people. So I think this is talking about the Antichrist. I want to ask you if you agree. And uh, if you have any ideas about who the people is, uh, Jesus, he has been talking to me about the scripture. Well, you know, yeah. uh, what? Yes, only you are correct. It's talking about the Antichrist here. When you go from verse number uh, 21 on, it says a vile person will stand up. That's the Antichrist. And from verse 21 through verse 45 of this chapter, it devotes itself to the Antichrist. So he comes up and becomes strong with a small people. I do not yet know who that small people is. Here's what we do know, however. We know there's going to be a ten nation alliance. And then among that ten nation alliance, there's going to be another king that will come up among the ten, uprooting three. And he will gain influence and gain power until finally he waxes great, the Bible says. This is all recorded in Daniel chapter number 7. And then he will make war against the saints for time, times, and half a time, for three and a half years. He will make war against the saints until the Ancient of Days comes. So all during the final three and a half year period, during the Great Tribulation, this person that comes up, uh, in this uh, with a small people. Now that's the question I cannot answer for you. I, until the 10 comes, mm -hmm. we won't know and we really won't know until the one uproots three of the 10, at which time we will know for sure. Jesus, he has been uh, talking to me about this scripture. Yeah, well, it's, it's his word. And yeah, yeah, uh, you know, um, Jesus himself, uh, he came from, he, he, he was born in Bethlehem. But he was called from Egypt, and he was uh, called a Nazarene. So 
So before he came, it was hard to understand actually what was meant, what was actually meant here. So I, I fully agree with you that the, the European Union will, 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 be his, uh, will be his power base. But I also think it, uh, it is pretty clear that he will be uh, the leader of the, uh, uh, the Russian uh, army because he is a uh, Gog of Magog in Ezekiel uh, going uh, towards the Battle of Armageddon. But he's not coming up from, from, from Russia because that is uh, definitely not a small people. I believe the small people it is talking about is, uh, is the Palestinian people because uh, that's where that's very central central uh, for, for what's going to happen with the with the dividing of the land and the uh, and the, 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 the confirming of the covenant. Well, we'll have to wait and see how that happens. What we know for sure is that those 10 nations have to be a part of the Holy Roman Empire because the same 10 nations are portrayed in Daniel 2, 42 through 44. The toes of the uh, statue are of iron mingled with clay, which is the Holy Roman Empire. And those are the last 10 kings. And this king will come up among those last 10 kings. Uh, Daniel 2, 44 says it this way. And in the days of these kings, these 10 kings symbolized by the 10 toes, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that will never be passed away and never be destroyed. So I just can't nail it down for sure right now, Olay, but uh, keep on studying, keep on watching, because one of these days we'll know for sure, because it's all going to come to pass exactly like the Bible says. I absolutely agree. Okay, well, listen, Ole, I appreciate the phone call all the way from Denmark. Keep listening. And uh, I think, let. I think, uh, I think this uh, Antichrist, his beginning will be uh, as a new Arafat, but a big one. Yeah, he will, well, lead, he will be the leader of the Palestinian people, I'm pretty sure. Well, we'll have to wait and see how that happens. We know he's got to come up among the Holy Roman Empire, which is in Europe. So how he could be the leader of the Palestinians and yet do that, well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, appreciate the phone call, Ole. Let me let you go. I've got others waiting in line now. Uh, let's, let me see. We're up against a break. So all of you stay right there. I will get to all of you in the next segment of the program right now. I want to emphasize to you, we're getting really close to our tour to Israel. Maybe you've been dreaming to go in a lifetime, but you've still got time to do it. If you're interested, give us a call. The number to call is 1-800-EDTIME. Ask to speak to someone about the tour. My daughter Jana or my granddaughter Holly will talk to you. They are experts. They'll tell you all about it, answer all your questions. So call us right now. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. 1-800-363-8463. In March 2000, I was leading our annual prophecy tour to Israel. We had made the decision to stop by the United Nations before leaving the United States. After taking the tour of the UN, there was a man who was going to give our group a briefing. And here's what he said to us. He said, now some people think that the United Nations is a world government. He said, it's nothing like that. He said, the UN is involved in global governance. And I was stunned when he said it. And I just couldn't resist. I felt like I had to ask the man without abusing him, without taking advantage of him. And so I asked him, uh, sir, could you explain to us the difference between global governance and global government? He stopped and he swallowed a couple of times and he said, you know, that may not be easy. I knew it wasn't going to be easy because I'd already looked it up in Webster's Third International Dictionary. It has a one word definition. The word governance means government. To find out more about our DVDs on world government, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. We're going right back to the phones now and Emily is calling from South Carolina. Hello, Emily. Hi, Pastor Baxter. I just wanted to tell you, I have the um, DVDs, you know, the End Time series, and um, I'm having the Bible study at my house, and um, the people love it. Um, they, they are saying that it's so easy to understand, and just wanted to share that with you. And I've got a, even a lady that I actually just read the email just a few seconds ago that said, 
can you invite a couple of other people to come? So it was real exciting to, to hear that. She's all excited. She's bought your DVDs as well and um, sharing them with her family, and it's just kind of spreading around. But I wanted to share that with you. Um, I, I also had a suggestion that um, I would love for the pastors to um, get the DVD packages. I think it would be so helpful, and I don't know if you could do some kind of special deal for them. I'm, I don't I don't know what the finances are and all, but um, it'd be nice if people could order it for their pastors to, to watch and get it out there for, you know, the main guys, and then they could teach it to the you know, to their um, churches. But. Hey, Emily, it's a great idea. Maybe we could run a pastor's special or something. Yeah, because I would, I would definitely buy a couple of them. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, well, listen, anyway, we'll, thank you so much. It makes it so much easy. You know, it, it just is, re it's a revelation. <laughs> it's yeah. revelation. It's awesome. Well, thank e you. Emily, the best thing that I ever hear is people say, I really understood it. It was easy to understand because that's the goal. And uh, I do think that we were able to get that done, and I've had I've had hundreds of people tell me I really understood it. They're so used to studying prophecy and coming away c more confused than when they began. But that won't happen to you with the Understand the End Time series. So we sure appreciate the feedback, Emily. Yes, and and for anybody out there who hasn't had it, oh my goodness, it's eye opening. Please go to the site and and order it. It's it's eye-opening, and you do. You totally understand it. But thank you so much and appreciate all that you've done and um, sharing it with us, and God bless you. Bye. Thank you, Emily. That's so nice of you to say that. And if you would like to have your own copy of Understanding the End Time, it's 14 one-hour DVDs. Uh, and you can just listen to them one at a time, and everyone will be a new revelation. It will certainly excite you. It'll change your worldview. It'll change your life, actually. I've had so many people look at me and say, it changed my life. Uh, so if you're interested, call us, 800 in time Just tell them you want the Understanding the End Time series. They'll know exactly what you want. Uh, so let's get back to the phone, and let's go now to Nick. He's calling from Florida. Hi, Brother Baxter. How are you today? I'm wonderful, Nick. You? Have a, I'm doing well. Um, I have a question about the four horsemen. Okay. And the way you take it on the each horseman being a government or a political entity that was on the earth at that time. Yes. Um, let's see. Verse 3, the red horse rides, which you say is communism. Yes. Then verse 5, the black horse rides, which you say is capitalism. Yes. I was just wondering how that works in the timeline, since in the course of history, capitalism came before communism. Why the red horse rides first? Well, actually, if you go to the last horse, that the King James translates the pale horse, but the proper translation is the green horse. Um, because the word there that was translated pale is chloros, which is Greek for green. And Islam is the green power. Islam actually was before communism or capitalism. So the next question is, well, then why? Now, we know that the first horse, the white horse, was Catholicism. And that was born somewhere around 300 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea. But then uh, Islamism came along somewhere in the mid-600s. Mid so obviously, the order is not absolutely essential here. It, uh, I've thought a lot about that, Nick. And one thing about it is communism had its heyday back in the uh, 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Henry Kissinger thought the whole world was going communist back in those times. Uh, however, the tide shifted. And then capitalism came on strong during the days of George Bush. It looked like the whole world was going into democratic capitalism. Well, now that sort of stalled. And now Islam is one of the strongest forces on the face of the earth right now, with it looking like Islam is going to take over all of Europe. So it may be listed in the order of when they really have their strongest historical period, not necessarily when they first came into existence. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. That's the way I've thought about it. I've tried, to, I've mulled over your very question, uh, trying to understand exactly how it is, but that makes the most sense to me. All right, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Nick. And now we're going to, we're going to Jim in South Bend. Hello, Jim. Yeah. 
I was a professional boxer for 20 years with 112 pro fights, and I have a 21-year-old daughter, and I would not allow a pervert dressed up like a woman to follow her in the bathroom. I would go to jail for it, and I think the American people need to get a little backbone and stand up for their rights. Well, you know, Jim, we do. The question is, what's the best way to do this? The best way to do it uh, when we're voting for president this fall, we're going to be voting for probably two, three, or four Supreme Court justices, and whoever puts them in there, if the people presently in charge of the government name the next three or four Supreme Court justices, we're going to be stuck with an ultra-liberal court for the next 30 or 40 years, and America may never be the same again. That may be the most important issue in the present presidential election. If you vote with, on one side, you're gonna get conservative judges and that will put the uh, United States of America back on a course of sanity. If you're going to vote the other side, you're gonna end up getting same-sex marriage, transgender, and who knows what kind of idiocy we will end up with. So probably, yep. Uh, if you can stay out of jail between now and then, you need to vote for the people that will put the right kind of Supreme Court justices in. Well, also, um, the United States, they just don't seem to stand up for themselves and don't get no voice, and the media seems to be all liberal, and I think that there is more media on these liberal viewpoints than there is actuality numbers of people. Well, you know, uh, the statistics, the polls have said that 85% of the journalists, 85% of the media people are liberal and vote liberal. Consequently, their liberal viewpoints come in. So anybody that's conservative, they just find every little misstep or misspeak that they make and just harp on it and harp on it and harp on it and try to make them look like a dummy. Yeah, but the majority of the people on the street, the numbers of people are not liberal like that. They're conservative. I live with them and talk to them. And uh, I think the whole voting thing, I think that they're doing it on computer and say, what, do you want a paper trail? What, you don't trust us? And who knows how this computer voting, they can make it do whatever they want, and there's no proof because there's no paper trail. You know, that bothers me, Jim, because I've wondered, uh, how do we know? that they don't tamper with the electronic results. And uh, Donald Trump has raised that very concern during this past week. Uh, he's afraid it's rigged. So I'm hoping that the Republicans are out there with the necessary technological people and the necessary lawyers in place to make sure that all of these things are coming out truthful. Because we know in times past there were quite a number of counties in Cleveland, for example, uh, in the last election, Mitt Romney got zero votes in several of the large counties. Now I'm talking about out of a couple of million votes, he didn't get one vote. And many people just are sure that was totally rigged because it just makes no sense whatsoever that there's not at least one conservative living up there in that area. So we do have a big problem in that regard, and I think we all need to be praying very diligently about that. Plus, I'm hoping that Donald Trump and company will have lawyers at every possible location where those votes are tallied to make sure that there's no... Um, uh, no tinkering with the totals uh, and that no matter who wins, all of us want the vote to be fair. And that's what's the, so critical. The government actually said, what, you don't trust us? You want a paper trail? And they avoid, they don't want a paper trail. Well, the bottom line is there needs to be a way to verify. And I'm not sure, I have not studied carefully exactly what the checks and balances are supposedly. I did read an article within the last couple of days that the databases are so unsecure that they would be easily hacked by people who knew how to do it. 
And that doesn't give any of us confidence, whether we're Republican, Democrat, independent, or whatever we may consider ourselves. So consequently, uh, we, are, we're, we are very concerned and we need, need to be very prayerful about that as well. Okay, I thank you much for taking my call. Okay, well, thank you, Jim, as well. And I was giving you some of this article. Thankfully, the Supreme Court, rather than voting four to four, which would have confirmed the lower court ruling and would have forced all the schools to allow a person to go in any bathroom they want to go into. Mr. Breyer said, I don't think that's right. He, even though he favors the other side, he voted on the opposing side in order to hold it off until the full court can come back into session. And so that's where it stands. It's good news. Let me give you a couple of paragraphs more out of this thing. It says, the court's action, while not a ruling, signals at least four justices are skeptical of the Obama administration's stance. While that's enough to grant a petition to review the lower court ruling, it will take at least five votes to issue a ruling. So if they hold this off until the new president comes in and appoints the next Supreme Court justice, if we get a conservative Supreme Court justice, which Trump has promised to do, then it will go against boys going into girls' showers and bathrooms and girls going into boys' showers and bathrooms. It will vote against that, whereas if we get the liberals, it will go the other way. And that's, what's, that's one of the biggest things at stake in this whole thing. One other paragraph in this article. Wednesday's order comes as a federal judge in North Carolina is weighing arguments on whether to put on hold the state's controversial measure known as House Bill 2. It says public restrooms and changing facilities, including in schools and colleges, must be segregated by sex as defined by the physical condition of being male or female, which is stated on a person's birth certificate. So both sides are fighting. Well, we've, we've run out of time. Let me quickly say to all of you, Three things. We advertised early in the program, when will the rapture happen? That DVD, it's a single DVD. It's available to you. Call us 800 in time. The trip to Israel, if you want to go with Judy and I, or if you just want to check it out, call us. They'll send you the information. The number is 1-800-END-TIME. And if you'd like your own copy of the Understand the End Time series that we were talking about a little bit early in the program, that number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. And then finally, to be a partner with us here at End Time Ministries. As we're closing in on the rapture, the time's just ahead. We need everybody joining together. Please become a partner with us, whether it's for a small amount or whatever size amount you feel like God wants you to do. In order to do that, call us at 1-800-END-TIME. You can also do all the above things by going to our website at endtime.com, E-N-D, T-I-M-E dot com. God bless you all. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. End of the Age is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.